Hello and welcome to the Event Manager Podcast. In this episode, I am joined by Stephanie Chung, the Director of Strategy and Insights at Market ID. Stephanie is a marketing executive passionate about the intersection of culture and social impact. In her role at Market ID, she leads product development and identifies emerging trends and data for the new market opportunities in both mice and travel trade segments. Stephanie has a BA in finance from Villanova University and a master's degree in education and is a certified incentive specialist, CIS. Prior to Market ID, she has worked in marketing roles across multiple industries and as a consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers. During her free time, you can find her doing yoga, kickboxing, reading historical fiction, or planning her next international adventure. Wow, Stephanie, I feel very busy already reading that. Uh, welcome to the show. <laughs> you know, I, I just had to keep to my New York identity, which is you have to stay busy. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Miga. So I wanted to start by diving a little bit deeper into what is Market ID, the company, and about your uh, particular role, uh, Director of Strategy and Insights. What does that really mean? Yeah, and and I think uh, a natural question is, you know, how do I explain that to my friends and family? I really just tell them that I help cities, countries, and venues tell their stories and turn their stories into driving economic impact. Uh, but Market ID as an agency we were formerly known as Marketing Challenges International, and we are just about our 40-year mark. And as a full-service marketing agency, services range from developing a destination brand strategy to doing market research on a specific industry sector. Maybe you are um, an association sales manager at a destination and you want really specific information on all informational technology um, international associations around the world. So we would delve into market research study on that to representing your destination industry events. We leverage really a wide variety of marketing tools in order to reach audiences, including targeted emails, social marketing, so on and so forth. But all of this is with the ultimate objective of really converting high value sales leads. And over the last 40 years, we've worked with many destinations in the world, including the Barcelonas, Berlin, Sydney's, Copenhagen. Currently, our roster of clients are Panama, Dubai, and South Korea. Amazing. Um, sounds like you do a lot of different things. Do you kind of work with the destination to create their, their themes and their marketing and all their outdoors and their kind of trade show uh, booths and all that kind of thing? I mean, how far does it go? It depends on the client. So for some clients, we will we will do all of that. We are also representing them at the actual trade show. So we do everything from the booth setup to actually executing the sales appointments at the trade shows. For some destinations, it might actually be a, a super strategic um, relationship where we're talking about this should be your approach to the North American market. And here are the key industry events that you need to go to. Um, you should make sure you have X, Y, Z types of activities throughout the year. Yeah. And so does it always focus on the North American market? It's kind of That free. is our sweet spot. Yes. But our clients are typically all, um, are all international destinations outside of North America. Okay. And how did you kind of learn about the agency and market ID. I mean, did you did you were you aware of this segment and this type of part of the industry before you 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 joined? Most definitely not. <laughs> I applied online. Okay. So it is the 21st century answer, I guess. Um, but for me, I've you know gone through and experienced multiple industries and roles. Um, in my career and in through all of it, for me, what was most important was always just to stay open-minded. Um, I think my favorite questions, I actually recently was chatting with my grandma and she was recounting some early childhood memories. She was like, you were always asking why and how. Um, and I would definitely say to this day, those are two of my favorite questions. And really leading with that throughout my career was probably ultimately what landed me um, into what I would say is really my, my dream industry, 
Um, so I'm first generation American and I definitely probably caught the travel bug because I would grow up traveling between New York City and Hong Kong. And those 16 hour flights definitely prepared me <laughs> well for this industry. Uh, and I started really thinking as I was developing my career, well, what is the impact of what I want to do? And how do I find, how do I make sure I wake up every day just excited to go to work? And um, luckily came across this industry and this role and um, really happily growing with it. And as with everyone, being able to continue to thrive during a pandemic has been a really fun challenge, I have to say. Okay. Um, as someone who's experienced a lot of different industries, I'm curious how long it kind of took you to kind of learn the industry. And then at what point did you decide that, hey, this is actually where I, I want to be? The hardest part about first starting must have been all the industry jargon the you know all the key terms like AMCs, PCOs, and understanding the nuance of even the corporate segment in understanding that there are so many players to who makes a decision ultimately on a destination. What drives me and keeps me in this industry is understanding the value and the importance of travel. Because at the end of the day, that is what's going to be the most enriching life experience that you can have. That's how people will learn and how people will understand different perspectives. And so that's what really excites me is that I don't, you know, I don't see a client as a client with a particular objective of just getting North American travelers to their destinations. Um, it's thinking about it as cultural exchange and understanding that ultimately it's really enriching the traveler when they go to those destinations. And then likewise, the local communities and the destinations being able to thrive, not only economically, but also having that cultural exchange when they have visitors coming into their destination. Interesting. And, and, and so let's, let's dive in a little bit deeper there. I think, um, is that, I assume you think events are, are good and, and valuable and, and, and um, you know, and worthwhile, <laughs> I guess, right? Um, is, is, it, is it that travel, uh, that cultural exchange that you think is, the, is what makes them valuable? Definitely not. I, I think it will, it, it's definitely not the only thing that makes them valuable. And the difference between traveling and traveling for events is of course the the knowledge piece of it right you're going to an event with a specific objective but i think the greatest events are the events that drive change events are the business of inspiration really it's about knowing your audience and knowing what they want to learn and then using that and using events as a medium in order to deliver that and then while you're at the event, it's what content do they want? What format do they do they need that in in order to learn it? Yep. So the um the content and 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 making sure that the content is delivered in the in the best possible way and, and that really makes that that change, hopefully. Um Exactly. And, and and how much do you feel that a destination can impact that? Uh because you know, obviously you're saying that the content is the thing that causes the change, but it, it, it feels like the destination can also be helpful in that or be part of the bigger picture. Um, how do you feel that that is, in what way do you feel that is, that is important and how do you kind of maximize that? Loaded question, we can, <laughs> because we can dissect it from so many ways. Um, if we, let's take a, and I think we can dissect it in so many ways because we need to understand the nuances of each market segment within the events industry. Because if we're talking about the association world and looking at the way they make a decision on which destination they go to can be twofold. It's very much a push and a pull in the sense that if you're a cardiology association and 
you have already certain chapters around the world, which are local hubs, let's say for the Europe hub, as an example, you're selecting which cities to build local chapters in or local members because you recognize that either there's a need for it in that region of that institutional knowledge, or there is already existing experts in that region. So now you're going in and you're expanding and growing your kind of positioning your association as a thought leader because you're associated with XYZ region. So yeah, the, the destination the flip- selection is very much based on the business strategy or the association growth strategy in, in that case. Absolutely. And then on the flip side, as a destination, probably something that you've heard a lot of is destinations now are moving towards making sure they have themselves defined which industry sectors they are an expert in, in order to attract those associations to have their international events there. So that's a little bit of the push and pull nuance I was describing on that side. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at the corporate market, likewise, we're then dissecting the corporate market to understanding, well, is it a internal corporate meeting for their sales team? Is it a product launch? Is it a incentive program? And then in each one of those, there's nuances to the role of the destination, right? Because for the incentive program, you want to have a hot, sexy destination that all of your top performers are going to work really hard towards um, in order to go to that destination. And then the destination's role in securing that will be to communicate, okay, when you come here, these are the unique experiences that you can have that you can't have anywhere else. And that's what differentiates us. In a way that feels like that's more around luxury travel or unique experiences travel. Exactly. Um, So it's more about, yeah, maximizing that side of things as much as possible. Yeah. And the unique experiences bit is interesting too, because, you know, we're at an age where all of your major global cities around the world, you're going to go there with an expectation of having a great restaurant experience of having a five-star hotel experience with great staff. Every major city in the world is going to tell you, you're going to come here and you're going to experience that. So how are we pushing the envelope and how are we digging deeper into the cultural assets, um, into leveraging kind of maybe infrastructure or local communities within those cities and countries to better position for incentives. Then on the corporate side, really we're looking at business strategy. Like you mentioned earlier, if I'm doing a product launch, I'm going to be launching in a place where I expect to grow my business. So from a destination perspective, it's about being able to communicate the ease of doing business in your, in your destination, what benefits a corporation can have by doing business there and also support, right? So there are always these kind of more tangible financial incentives that a destination can provide. And so are these all factors that you consider when you're making recommendations and and working with clients in order to, for that, for, for, I guess, answering those questions or, or, or putting together marketing that showcases how destinations can help in those areas, for example, the different um, industries and different things that that they have at that destination that maybe uh, planners and people involved in events are are not aware of. I I expect this is all part of your recommendations and when you work with a destination, right? Exactly. And a part of doing that is to be able to give the destination some candid feedback about right now, this is how you're perceived. So then let's figure out what your goals are and types of what are your target events? What type of events do you want to attract? Let's compare those two. And then let's go back to the drawing board and figure out what is the marketing communication strategy in order to communicate that you can fit the needs of your target events. 
And on the planner side, because of course, a big part of what our company does is also to service meeting planners. We will really be the face of all of these different convention bureaus that we work with. And by doing that, we're actually having sales calls with meeting planners and event planners. And in those conversations, we're trying to understand, well, what are your needs? And then we can better direct them towards a destination that will fit those needs. So a couple questions here. Do you ever have destinations that, you know, want to attract a type of event where you say, you know what, that's probably a little bit far from your current uh, reputation and, and you have to advise them to, to aim, you know, somewhere else, and maybe not lower, but sort of redirect their expectations in some sense? Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Redirecting expectations or like managing expectations must be just the crux of what every agency's has to do most <laughs> definitely. And I think event planners probably resonate with this a lot as well, or really any person in a sales role. Um, it's about being realistic, I think. And it's great to have a reach goal. So we encourage that, right? Because that's a vision for what your destination or your venue will have in XYZ timeline. When we manage expectations, it's more so about having a constructive conversation on timeline, right? It's okay, if that is your reach goal, then here are the milestones we're gonna set in place in order to reach that. Um, but also it's about asking the right questions. So how can we take that reach goal and then let's break it down further? Well, like, what are the reasons why that, that's the goal? And then more tangibly from an infrastructure perspective, can a planner do X, Y, Z thing? What is, what are all, what are the maximum number of hotel beds that you have around the convention center? Because there may also be a, uh, a lack of, or enough rooms for the size of the, convention center or, or vice versa. So there are the tangible product assets that we need to talk about um, beyond just having a goal. And then on top of that, having a nuanced understanding of all the stakeholders that a convention bureau is reporting back to. Because even within convention bureaus, you have ones that are association-based. So they have their hotel partners or their DMC partners that pay to be represented, right? In those instances, they're responding to different reach goals for that reason. And then you have convention bureaus that are fully government funded. And there may then be a little bit more, a little bit more flexibility in when they can reach the goal. But again, they're reporting to st stakeholders that don't understand the specifics of the market. So asking the right questions to then guide the client to a more attainable goal. Yeah, and you can't control exactly what, what is being built or how many rooms there are, so you always have to work around those, those limitations in many ways. Right. The, the other question I had was, you mentioned talking to planners and sort of doing sales calls with planners, and I think this is quite interesting. And what do you see as the advantages of, of having you do that rather than the destination directly, you know, rather than the destination, either, you know, from their home country or, for, or if they have an office in the US, etc. What makes it, you know, what makes you, are the, are the conversations that you're having different in some way because you're kind of more independent or you're, you're, you're not, you know, directly or, you know, government employee directly or anything like that? Exactly. Um, it positions us as a more neutral third party. Also, we are really transparent with sharing with planners that we are not commission-based in the relationship that we have with the destinations that we represent. So because of that, we have no bias to needing to sell one over the other, depending on the type of contract we have. It just doesn't matter because we're not commission-based at all. So the type of relationships that we have with the meeting planners is a trust that we have their best interest in heart and that we'll be able to communicate within their time zone, because time zone is a big one, especially with some of our clients that will have a 12 hour time difference with North America. We are able to communicate with them in their time zone, in their language, 
and really effectively then take the problem of what they're trying to solve and communicate that to the end destination. Because I do have to say that, as you know, from working with a lot of international folks, things get lost in translation. So part of our role is also just making sure that all the boxes are checked and then we're maybe repackaging uh, what that destination is going to share in a different way in a, in a way that's going to meet the needs of the meeting planner. Because as we, as we know, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Mm. Yeah, I like that. And so I think this decision to be not to not be commission based, I think is, is quite an interesting decision. And it does position you in a, in a way that is quite different to anybody who's acting on commission or who's a sales representative on commission. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you for taking us through that. I think that's a, an excellent insight into the world uh, of the, the type of agency that the destination agency or I don't, how would you describe the type of agency that you are? We are a des full service destination marketing agency. Destination marketing agency. Excellent. Okay. So I wanted to take a moment to also talk about uh, technology. I know this is an area that you cover a little bit and, and, and technology uh, solutions for marketing. Um, talk to me a little bit about how destinations uh, are leveraging new technology solutions for marketing. What's, what's exciting in your world in that side? And just like everyone else, we were forced during this pandemic to think innovatively. And, mm -hmm. you know, as you know, we rebranded during this time. And during our rebrand, we were thinking really critically about, well, what does the industry need right now? And who are the new players? And how do we make sure that our destinations are continuing to push the envelope and grow? So in, uh, in the end of um, 2020, start of 21, we conducted a study with New York University, NYU. Um, we surveyed the top 35 convention cities and we took a look at technology tools, how they're being implemented and the impacts of that ultimately from a marketing and sales perspective. So what we found to no surprise is that 90% of convention cities are using just webinars as sales tools. So we took this and we thought about, well, what is the issue with this? The issue with this is that that's not how you're going to, that's not what sales is, right? Sales is relationships. And it's quite simply put, as we all experience, the missing element of webinars as a sales tool is that you're not creating moments of laughter. People are not engaged and so we took all of that and then we were really just thinking about, well, how do we make sure that there's energy? How do we make sure that there's a personalized experiences and that add value to the meeting planners that would be in attendance to these events that destinations would put on? So I'll take um, an example of something interesting that we did for Korea. We utilize virtual reality platforms in highlighting different key cities and venues within the destination. So that range from Jeju Island to COEX, which is a convention center, to Busan, to Alpensia Resort. We took, we went through the whole process of actually coordinating the event, but also recruiting the buyers to attend. So then meeting planners who attended were in a scavenger hunt, a virtual scavenger hunt, in different breakout rooms. And within each room, they were tasked to solve really specific meeting planning related questions using virtual reality platforms for each individual city and venue. The most rewarding part about this was me popping through each room and literally seeing people say, we got to go quicker. We, we need to figure this part out. No, that's not it. And the high level of engagement and the feedback that we get after from meeting planners, um, one in particular saying it was like the best interactive event that they've gone to throughout the year. Um, but all of that to say is technology is just a tool and there is a way to repurpose and retool it to meet the goals that you need, but it's just about being thoughtful um, mm -hmm. in and also being willing to take a risk because 
if that's not something that you've traditionally done, it's hard to explain to leadership that, oh, we still need to have XYZ funds in order to do this. Um, so I, I, that's an example of, I think, one way technology can be repurposed during this time. But um, it just from a big picture perspective, technology can really then as a destination can be repurposed into, I would say four main categories. One is engagement. Two is hybrid event capabilities. Three in the destination experience from a virtual perspective. And then four is communication of safety and security. Okay. And so we can kind of dive into any of those, well, but when before it's we dive in, yeah, let me, let me, let's go into this first example. I think this is quite interesting because, because I mean, essentially you, 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 you did event design there as so, well, right? You designed an event, um, you invited planners. Um, was this a, a tool that they could use on their systems that they have to have a VR set or anything like that, or they just use their, their, their normal, um, desktop systems or things like that. They couldn't use a desktop system. So they didn't need to have a whole VR set, but we gave specific instructions to all attendees before so that they knew they needed um, both their laptop and their phone, as well as prep them with what tools within the phone they should expect to use. Um, and it's a small detail, but it's details like that that makes an event successful, especially in the age where we're asking people to try a lot of things for the first time. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think it's quite interesting, and, and I think you make some really good points in terms of it's not just about the technology. It's nice to have the technology, and I think the technology attracts people and provides a different experience uh, and, and an immersive experience in this case. But but a lot of I think what you described there is just careful event design, right? Because you 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 planned it out, you figured out how to get people involved in it, uh, excited about it, and then you planned it out that they could join on the day and, um, you know, set up the teams, have an element of competition and then, you know, go through with it and, and hopefully have a, a memorable experience, which I imagine would be the kind of desired outcome from the whole, uh, the whole event and the whole marketing around it. Right. Yeah. And a desired outcome plus learning. I think we're all just, we have come to a, a time where everything is so digitized that there is a option for things to be really personalized, which then also means we no longer more than ever. Don't, we don't want to sit there being spoken to given the shame, same spiel. We want to experience something. So then the conversations about how do we get someone to experience it without physically being in the place, which is what a lot of destination marketing had the biggest challenge of during this time is we want to continue to build a pipeline of business. But if a person can't come for a site inspection, if a person can't come for um, a fam trip, how can we get them to have the experience element and learn about envisioning what a particular part of their event might be able to look like? Great. No, that, that, thanks for breaking that down for us and, and kind of going through that. Okay. So let's talk about these four elements and, and, I guess if you can um, give us an example of each one so we can understand what you mean and, and how that actually you know plays out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I break it down into four categories more because I'm trying, I really myself wanted to wrap my head around, can we even narrow the scope of conversation? Because it's a big beast to tackle, to just say technology is taking over the events industry. Um, and so I'm going to share all of these from the perspective of a destination um, in how I envision destinations to be able to better leverage technology. The first piece of it is engagement. So we are looking at, if you're in the sales team, you're looking at how, what are different ways you can engage with your prospective clients. And in this way, it probably overlaps the most with what meeting planners might do and elements that they might be including now in, in this virtual world. One is the gamification, which is the virtual reality scavenger hunt that I just went through. Two, like how are you using live polling um, with visualization within your webinars? Because maybe the webinar is the right tool for you. 
but can you still repurpose and add pieces into the webinar? Because let's be realistic in understanding that we're not going to scale zero to a hundred. You're not going to start with um, just having a destination presentation to all of a sudden doing um, scavenger hunts. So how do we break that down to smaller steps? Um, maybe there is, um, maybe you can implement collaboration tools between a, co a convention bureau and different partners. So there are platforms in which you can go into a brainstorm room and you can actually look at floor plans together right over them virtually. And whereas I think that element of collaboration has really been removed during this time, but thinking about platforms that will allow for you to still collaborate with your meeting planners. And a simple one, which everyone can implement immediately, emails. What format are the emails in? Can you add GIFs? Can you add videos? There's a company called BombBomb Bomb where you can actually record like a two minute video and that's part of your email text instead of having another like prospect, general prospecting email. So format of your emails. The second bit is hybrid event capabilities. So yes, we understand that there needs to be AV upgrades within your venues in the destination, but how are you communicating that? So one example of a recent international conference, that conference went to a hub and spoke model, but the main destination was the sponsor and they sponsored the event in their student in their country's main convention center they went into their studio space so they sponsored and hosted the main event from their broadcast studio to the hub and spoke model which was an international event so in that instance they were not only talking about their av capabilities but they were showcasing the success of it by directly being a sponsor of the broadcast studio. Um, second, maybe you're looking at um, having preferred partnerships or tools. So that could be an example of a value add for a meeting planner. Meeting planners are looking for solutions, right? They, they, it's a tough time for them because they're asked to repurpose meetings that they've planned the same way for many years. So as a destination or as a venue, could you work with a specific um, or a set of different technology tools? And because you have a preferred partnership, you can provide your meeting planner with a reduced rate. So if you're working with my venue, you can have XYZ um, as an event add-on, whether it be an app or, or the actual, let's say it might be a health and safety protocol related um, pre-screening. Could that be an element that you can share as a value add? So when you when you say a value add, you mean kind of as part of the bid process, you're saying, look, the destination exactly. has this in place, has this in place, uh, and this exactly. will be something that we can kind of support in some way. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that from a destination perspective, maybe you're contracting um, X amount of events for that particular technology partner. So because of that, you're able to have a discounted rate, and that is a value add that you can pass on. Um, with your clients. And that could be a key differentiator, especially because we know that hybrid's not going away and all these things. And and do you think that that is more important for the association sector or the corporate sector? Likely going to be more important for which whichever event organizer that has a really strict budget. That's really what it comes down to. And, and that could be in either sector, just depending on the sector. But I think the key here is thinking out of the box in how you're highlighting your technology capabilities or your hybrid capabilities. It's not just saying I have upgraded XYZ audio visual within my venue, or I have as a destination, I have 15 venues that have XYZ type of capability. It's going beyond that and saying, we have these capabilities and these are the solutions that we can offer when you're working at that particular venue. I, I imagine in the marketing, you still want to kind of wow the planners with the technical capabilities or the studios or something like that, but you want to go further than that. You want to kind of get into the details of how that 
saves people money and, and provides extra value. Exactly. Interesting. And the last bit on hybrid event capabilities is just continuing to test, right? Put your put your venue or your destination to the test and continue to stay abreast of new providers that can differentiate your product. Um, and then making sure that you have the, the support for that on-site technical support, because that might not have been a major source of revenue before. So maybe you didn't have um, on-site technical support at your particular venue. So it's rethinking what type of support will you need in order to better um, handle the type of requests that you're getting. Yeah, you really want to make sure that you're um, prepared for the type of uh, events that are coming forward. And I, I guess this is a way of of ensuring people that, that you are. Exactly. And the next piece, the third one, is the destination experience. And here, a lot of it is about you know, virtual reality tours as an example. And they've always been around. And obviously during the pandemic, it blew up. But there are industries that have been using virtual reality tours for a long time. For example, um, the housing industry, right? So in real estate, virtual reality tours and those capabilities have really long been developed. So are we repurposing and maximizing how that's being used. And there are a lot of tech startups that are already doing this really well. Um, I'll take an example of one called Matterpack. And within this virtual reality, like 3D tour you can take, you can add specific notes in parts of your room. You can add attachments directly into that section, a, a attachment document. You can go ahead and measure different parts of the room with the tool while you're in the room. So really looking at, well, what is a meeting planner looking at when they're doing their site inspection? And are there ways that you can still leverage a tool, a technology tool to speak to that? There is another company called Threshold. And this one is a little bit more venue specific, but Threshold allows you to see at a map level view all the different venues that you have within a destination. And then you can either hyperlink it to individual tours and also allow the person to see and get a feel of the neighborhood. Um, because depending on if you're representing a city or a country, aside from understanding, okay, this hotel or this convention center is going to be a good space for me, a planner wants to know what's the vibe there. Like, what are my attendees going to feel like um, on the grounds on these in this on these five blocks when they have free time? Um, next piece is live tours. So we have virtual reality tours. People are are going in there on their own time. But what about implementing live tours? Um, can your salesperson actually walk the planner through? on the spot using some of supplementing it with some of those tools we just discussed. Um, Amazon actually in 2021, mid 2021 launched a product called Amazon Explore. And they have like 450 handpicked experiences across 21 locations. And they are live virtual one-on-one -on -one experiences with hosts around the world. And the third one that I see is interesting is really this usage of audio. And of course, like Spotify playlist is something that we've done because maybe you have local sounds, uh, local artists of the area, but also we have Zoom fatigue, right? So we don't want to look at a screen all the time. We don't have to. You can experience something um, just through audio. So there's a concept called Unify Cosmos. And it's a interactive soundboard where you can, where they feature audio clips from like remote places around the world. So what about instead of just having rainforest sounds as, you know, a, a way of like a soothing background noise? What if it's the rainforest um, of a specific place in South America, as an example? So you're putting your destination on the map 
and tying in with wellness. There's a huge push of all these different meditation apps and audio clips where you can listen to, to just relax. Well, maybe those places already exist within your destination and you're creating an audio clip around it. I like it. I think they're all interesting examples and you're, um, you know, I think it's really that idea of expanding the the possibilities. Um, is, is there a danger when you when we do this? I mean, you talked about the, the virtual reality example. Here's the audio example. I think they're all interesting. But is there a danger that um, that you're kind of pushing the audience too far? You know, that, that idea that here, here's some really fancy new things, or here's an alternative way to consume this. Uh, but ultimately, people are sort of used to webinars and virtual events and kind of if it's a good one, then it, then it can be very good, right? It doesn't, it, they're not all bad. Um, how do you feel about that? Do you feel that, how do you prepare people for that, I guess, when, when, when you're kind of putting them or you're using technology that they're not used to? This is probably where my education background kicks in. Um, and I think it's about preparedness, right? So how do you, if you have XYZ objective or you're using a new tool, then we need to think about how do you make that tool accessible? So to your point, webinars are gonna work for a specific type of objective. An audio clip of your country's rainforest is going to work for a different objective. So it's about having multi-channel or omni-channel, as we like to say, communication and always staying top of mind with your target audience. And you can do that by engaging all these different types of tools or tactics that we just described. So reframing, are we pushing the audience further away to how do we make sure that our content is accessible in all ways. And, and do you think that there may be um, a generational kind of challenge with the audience? Uh, you know, you, you, you're targeting decision makers um, that may not be the most tech savvy or, you know, that rely on maybe the IT team to prepare their tech whenever they're doing something. If you're preparing, if you're showcasing something new to them, is there a danger that 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 kind of doesn't work or you can't get through the corporate firewalls when you when you need to? <laughs> um, I haven't had the issue with getting through with corporate firewalls. I imagine um, maybe for certain industries, it, it is very relevant. Um, I think that is where the really the tech expertise comes in. So being asking the thorough questions, yes, but also being okay with simply saying, I don't have the answer to this. So let's make sure we test and retest and retest before we move forward um, with trying a new platform. And I think that's one of the th things that people really need to learn the hard way. I hear this anecdotally a lot with different partners who are putting on a lot of virtual events because the idea or the thought might be, oh, it's easier because we don't have um, the logistics setup of needing to get a person A into the space and then person B needs to come out right after. Everyone's just on their computer so I can do all this for my computer. It's going to be easier. But in actuality, a lot of people then learn it takes more setup and more preparation and more um, preparing of each individual speaker um, or stakeholder within that experience to make it a well-run experience. So it's the preparedness and and just the testing. And you can never test enough, I think, to prepare for all the things that might come up. <laughs> yeah, always, always a big, a big, a big point, the preparedness. So looking kind of towards the future, um, I, I know you're into NFTs or you've done some research in this area. W would love to kind of get your take on how they are relevant in the event industry and, and particularly for the work that you do, where do you see that the potential there? There's so much buzz around NFTs and um, by no means am I an expert in it, but I, I really just think that we need to qu continue to question what the role is of blockchain 
and crypto within destination marketing or destination space. So I, I know that your team has written a great piece on thinking about NFT's relationship with event planners. So I'll just shift a little bit to talking about NFTs as it relates to destinations. And one of the ways where we already see it happening within different, at a country level, is there's something called the metaverse, right? So metaverse is still in its early stages, but it's basically a virtual hangout to interact with others do, through digital real estate. So you have big brands like Coca-Cola that are minting NFTs, which then a user can buy to personalize in the virtual world, which is the metaverse. Most recently, um, just a few months ago, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade in Barbados actually signed an initiative to dive deeper into the metaverse space and looking at digital real estate as sovereign land um, to create a metaverse embassy. And the type of projects that they're going to launch is going to be aimed at procuring digital real estate, building virtual embassies, providing e-visas, and offering um, services such as like streamlining um, and supporting their visitors, and ultimately then to promote the nation's tourism industry. Um, we'll take like Korea as an example, had also committed a large amount of funds to a metaverse Seoul project. Seoul is the capital of Korea, and they hope to complete it by 2026, but they want to allow kind of public workers to communicate with the public on the metaverse platform using 3D avatars and virtual environments. Um, so that's set to debut in kind of the coming year. But there are already destinations that are leveraging the metaverse and NFT space in thinking about, again, another way to continue to build their kind of clout, if you will. I think that's that's fascinating. Is this a... You know, I assume in some sense, these are targeting decision makers, or ideally they'd be targeting decision makers uh, at some point. But is that sort of assuming that decision makers, current decision makers will be venturing into the metaverse? Or is it kind of more focused on the people that are in the metaverse or that are experimenting in the metaverse that may not currently be decision makers, but may become decision makers or may want to organize an event in a destination at some point in the future. Yeah, I, th I think you're hitting the nail on the head with like both segments. And most, I think also some a point not to be missed is we can say that a lot of different meetings or events are not going to happen again the same way that it will. Sure. But let's also stay abreast of what are the new industries that as a result of their developments will need to meet. So as a result of developments within the NFT space and metaverse space, there are now metaverse international global events and conferences, right? So one piece of it is to stay relevant. The other piece of it is also, let's make sure we're getting in front of people who will be decision makers in the future. Yeah, I think that's that's very valid, and I think it makes a lot of sense to be looking at all these different perspectives. Stephanie, thank you for sharing all this with us. This is uh, an interesting insight into the world of, of destination marketing and also uh, an interesting insight into the technology around that, which is obviously, you know, at EventMB, we cover technology and innovation a lot, but this is not a part of technology that we've covered in a lot of detail. So uh, maybe there is an opening there to, to go into more detail and, and to explore this world a little bit more. So thank you for bringing that onto our radar. No, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. We need to wrap up, uh, but uh, I, I really enjoy this conversation. I want to ask you the question that I always end the podcast with, which will hopefully help us find new and interesting guests for future episodes of the podcast, which is who would you recommend um, that we should invite uh, to also join us on the podcast? I would recommend Greg Bog. He's the chief experience architect of Merit's Global Events um, and really interesting work that his team is doing because they're using neuroscience principles to improve the overall guest journey.
Yes, I know Greg well. Uh, Bogman on uh, on Twitter, I believe, I think is his handle. So uh, excellent, I think excellent choice. And we'll uh, we'll get in touch to, with Greg and see if he would like to join us on the podcast. Thanks again, Stephanie, for joining us. Good luck with everything and keep us posted on the uh, amazing projects that you're doing on the metaverse. I look forward to uh, being invited to an event of yours on the metaverse and exploring that in more detail. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Event Manager Podcast. Please subscribe and rate the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. For the latest news and the best articles on technology and innovation in the event industry, head over to eventmd.com.